my channel uh, here it's evening so i'm going to say good evening this is nursing with koi and i do cover topics uh various health topics certain diseases certain cancers uh, because this is an educational informational channel it is very informative on different kinds of diseases today i'm going to be covering uterine fibroids and this is something that is close to me because this i have experience so i'll also be sharing my story on the same uh, so the, if this is your first time here, please take your time to subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you're notified every time I upload an informative video such as this one. And if you're a returning subscriber, know that I deeply, deeply appreciate you. So a little disclaimer is that I am not a diagnostician, I am not a doctor, I am a nurse and I practice nursing. I have tended to patients with some of the conditions I speak about in this channel, but I am not the one who does the diagnosis. I play a role during treatment for patients already who have showed up in hospital because I work in a hospital. So if you're experiencing any of the symptoms of the diseases that I, I do on this channel, please have yourself checked out because it is important to have information and get empowered but action is key and action is dependent on what you decide to do for your own health. So in the event that you experience any of these symptoms that I'm going to describe today about uterine fibroids and uh, you fit in the criteria of those people who get that disease, then you can get yourself checked out properly in a hospital. So as we remain safe, I am not diagnosing anybody and I'm not describing these symptoms to scare anybody. I will just share my own experiences and sometimes for where I do not have experiences, I'm just going to give information as it is because this is a patient education channel as well as a health education channel in general as well as a nurse teaching channel. So I do this for the nurses, I do this for the patients, and I do this for the general public who wishes to know anything about whatever condition. And again, if you have a disease that you would want me to cover, please comment down in the comment section down here. Let me know what I could actually research on and present. This is based on research. Sometimes I do actual book reading. Sometimes I have to go to different presentations of research. Sometimes I have to go to online and do online books and online resources. And this helps me gather information regarding whatever I present about. So it's not all information from my head, except when I'm sharing my own experiences or I am telling my own story. So I want to start by answering a very important question. And this is why should women know about fibroids or fibroids, whichever pronunciation you prefer. Uh, but uh, women should know about fibroids because it's a very common condition and those who experience symptoms with this actually find it very hard to live with. About 20 to 80 percent of all women will develop fibroids by the time they are age 50. Uh, as those women, especially in their 40s and 50s, will begin experiencing symptoms and most probably will present with fibroids. Not all women with fibroids, though, will get symptoms. So this is the tricky part. And even the symptoms that come are usually varying in range. So there would be uh, mild symptoms, moderate symptoms, and severe symptoms. Those with severe symptoms, those with symptoms, the symptomatic fibroids can be very hard to live with. More knowing from experience, I have experienced the pain and the heavy bleeding. So yeah, so mostly... Uh, the most common symptoms is pain and menstrual bleeding or heavy menstrual bleeding. Then there is, uh, when they are too large, there is pressure on the abdominal, lower abdominal region and you could experience frequent urination, uh, rectal pressure, abdomen distension or enlargement because of the size of these fibroids. If they are very large, they could look like you are already expecting and you could look like a, a fully pregnant woman. And this is quite sensitive because I have seen, I have friends who people thought were expecting all along. And then they all of a sudden did not have the pregnancy and they thought they have just gotten their baby and they are wishing you all the best. Congratulations. How is it a boy or a girl? And all along, those were just fibroids in there, and probably they have just had their myobectomy or hysterectomy. 
So that is why they no longer have the distended abdomen. So it could look like a pregnant lady. You could look actually like you are carrying life in you, but all you are carrying is fibroids. Fibroids are the most common non-cancerous tumors in women of childbearing age. Uterine fibroids are tumors or lumps made of muscle cells that grow within the walls of the uterus. Fibroids grow either as a single tumor or in clusters of tumors. A single fibroid can be less than one inch in size or can grow to about eight inches across or more. A bunch or cluster of fibroids can vary in size and there could be so many and sometimes you will hear of people saying I got 50 fibroids removed during my myomectomy or whatever surgery they went for. So they could be as many as you can count. And then fibroids are also known by other names such as leomyomas, myomas, uterine myomas and fibromas. So if you hear these terminologies, it is just fancy English for fibroids or uterine fibroids. So it is common they are commonly referred to as leomyomas and all these terms refer to fibroids and the other thing is that let us note and underline on the non-cancerous bit because sometimes there's that fear that any growth or any swelling that is not identified could be cancerous but most fibroids are non-cancerous it is unclear why fibroids develop but several factors may influence their formation the four common factors include hormones and this is either estrogen and progesterone and they are produced by the ovaries they are naturally occurring in women uh, they may cause the uterine lining to regenerate during each menstrual cycle and may stimulate the growth of fibroids that is one theory then we have family history and if for example you had somebody in your lineage that had fibroids you could get a child in that family getting fibroids they learn so especially let's say mother daughter mother sister grandmother they could have these symptoms and experience them and pass them down to their children uh, but uh, there is some genetic history then we have newly parity newly parity is the the, sit the status of not having ever gotten pregnant or carried a child in the womb or in the uterus ever. So if you have never had ch children, it is thought that most of those people who are, especially if you are nearing your 30s, then that could lead to fibroids. Or actually getting babies, you are you're usually encouraged to get babies because you could experience fibroids if you stay without having a child, a child and if this is prolonged especially if you're getting to your early 30s you still don't have babies this could crop in then we have pregnancy uh, this is a funny part pregnancy could lead to developing fibroids the lack of being pregnant again could also lead to you having fibroids uh, pregnancy increases the production of estrogen and progesterone the hormones in the body and the, we had talked about hormones being a major factor in the causality or etiology of fibroids so that is that a little bit makes sense so fibroids may develop and grow rapidly during pregnancy and this can be very uncomfortable as i will be sharing my story about fibroids because i have experienced it without a pregnancy and during pregnancy and during pregnancy you just have an angry angry uterus it is not happy so we have about five risk factors and these include age, family history, ethnic origin, obesity and eating habits. For age, as women age, especially those who don't have children again, the risk increases with time. Then after menopause, usually fibroids are thought to shrink or get smaller. So if someone is close to menopause, then they just wait it out, especially if the symptoms are mild. Family history, I had talked about that one. Then ethnic origin. If you are of African descent, even if you don't live in Africa, you are more predisposed to having fibroids. So it is a very common condition, especially in Africa, where it is where I are. I'm an African woman, so I am in the statistics. Then we have obesity. Again, Africa, we have a lot of um, women who are overweight or obese again this is a risk factor so when you're struggling with losing weight uh, you can lose it for 
probably to prevent yourself from getting fibroids or if you have them for them to get smaller or lessen. Then we have eating habits and red meat has been associated with fibroid formation. So, and this because it increases the risk, you just, uh, if you cut some of these things, uh, the modifiable factors, then you can stay away from fibroids. But it's not an exact science though. But uh, studies have shown that going completely vegan has helped in the treatment or in the home remedies for fibroids. So eating a lot of vegetables, especially green leafy vegetables, is known to protect women from developing fibroids or whether, when they have the fibroids, again, they don't grow as fast as they usually grow in other times. Another thing about diet, uh, sugar, dairy and gluten is also known to exacerbate the symptoms for fibroids. So if you can stay away again from these products, then your life will be a little bit easier if you're experiencing symptoms of fibroids. So there are different types of fibroids and we have about five types. The first type is submucosa fibroids and these occur just below the lining of the uterus and can cause menstrual problems including pain as they grow. Mm. Typically, they also cause heavy bleeding and this can be dramatic. Then we have intramural fibroids and these occur within the uterine wall which can cause enlargement of the uterus as they grow. Then we have subserosal fibroids and this fibroid grows on the outer wall of the uterus and usually causes no symptoms until it grows large enough to interfere with other organs. Then we have pedunculated fibroids and this develops when a subserosal fibroid grows a pentacle or a stalk. As they grow larger, then they become either twisted or and this causes actually severe pain. It can be very, very painful. And this is not like the contraction kind of pain. This is a pinpointed pain. You can actually pinpoint exactly where that thing is because it is excruciatingly painful. So it could actually be a medical or surgical emergency with pedunculated fibroids, depending on the size and depending on the severity of that symptom. Then we have interlig an interligamentous fibroids and this grows sideways between the ligaments which support the uterus or in the abdominal region. This can also cause dramatic symptoms. Sometimes if they are small, they may not cause any symptoms at all. But if they're large enough, they're going to create pressure and they can also cause dramatic, dramatic symptoms. So in this diagram, we are just describing the different types of these fibroids. And A, we have the subserosal fibroids, which are just found on the serosa layer of the uterus. Then we have B, uh, the intramural ones and you can see where they are then we have the penaculated fibroids uh, what we cannot see from this diagram is the interligamentous but we have penaculated you can see and the sub because of fibroids so it, it doesn't matter where they are they, if they are causing symptoms then you need to seek help signs and symptoms of fibroids most fibroids will not cause any symptoms and when they are symptomatic enjoy your life about 30 percent of women with fibroids will experience symptoms and these symptoms could include one heavy bleeding and bleeding in between the menses or periods and this may lead to anemia the second symptom is abdominal pain or pressure or feeling of abdominal fullness then we have frequent urination and in severe cases inability to urinate at all then we have pain during sexual intercourse, which is called dyspareunia. Then we have low, lower back pain. That one again increases, especially if they are big and large enough to cause this symptom. Then reproductive problems, and this is where you are not able to conceive because you have these masses. Uh, then we have painful periods, and the cramps in this condition can be so severe. There is just a lot of pain involved. So the symptoms will depend on where in the uterus the fibroids are located and the size of these fibroids. So how do you know for sure you have fibroids? Usually um, for their symptomatic cases, probably it's caught during pelvic examination for those women who attend Well Women's Clinic. And this is usually a clinic that is available once a year. You're not sick, you're just going to be checked out your organs, your everything. So during this well woman clinic, 
your doctor will actually do a pelvic examination and sometimes they are able to even palpate those masses and they can tell you you actually do have the fibroids if they're not causing any trouble again nothing will be done you're not going to be put on anything they're just going to monitor the, the masses as soon as they can then where there are symptoms uh, and especially any women presenting with pain and bleeding, the first investigation a doctor will order, even at very small hospitals, is an ultrasound. Either an abdominal pelvic ultrasound or a pelvic ultrasound. So usually, if the pain is not very, is generalized in the whole abdomen, they are going to do an abdominal pelvic ultrasound and just rule out anything. If there is a specific pinpoint area where they are able to pinpoint to that my pain is coming from the lower abdomen region, then they are going to do a pelvic ultrasound. If confirmation is needed, an ultrasound will be ordered and this will be used to confirm the diagnosis. A doctor or technician moves the ultrasound device or the transducer over the abdomen and places it. Uh, when you're doing the transvaginal one, you can do an, a transabdominal ultrasound and that is where the transducer is moved all over the abdomen. Sometimes they may need to do something called a transvaginal ultrasound and this is where the transducer will be placed in your vagina to get images of the uterus. So it could be two ways. Then there are some lab tests that could be done. If you have abnormal menstrual bleeding, the doctor may order a number of tests to investigate the causes, the potential causes. And this would be complete blood counts just to rule out anomalies of the hematological system or the blood system or to determine if you have anemia because of chronic blood loss and other blood tests to rule out other bleeding disorders or thyroid problems. Still on the diagnosis, we have magnetic resonance imaging and this is MRI in short. And this is an imaging test that shows in greater detail the size, the location of the fibroids, identifies the different types of the tumors and can help determine the appropriate treatment options. An MRI is almost often used in women with larger uterus or in women approaching menopause, that is perimenopausal women. Hysterosal Hysterosonography is another test that could be used to diagnose fibroids and this is also called a saline infusion sonogram. It uses sterile saline to expand the uterine cavity, making it easier to get images of submucosal fibroids because they are quite hard to diagnose and the lining of the uterus in women attempting pregnancy who have heavy menstrual bleeding. Then we have hysterosalpingography or salpingogram. In short, it's called HSG. And this one uses a dye to highlight the uterine cavity and fallopian tube on X-ray images. It is usually recommended, especially if fertility is an issue. Uh, I went through this procedure and it is not your cup of tea because whew, the pain, uh, it has drama in it but it's not so bad you can i actually came from work went for it and was able to walk for like half an hour after just trying to absorb the aftermath of that pain uh, but then it is quite accurate and can be helpful if you're in the ttc journey ttc in full is trying to conceive i went through that journey and i finally got uh, i was able i was successful eventually uh, but then this test uh, also is used to diagnose if you have blocked tubes or not and obviously mine were not blocked uh, but there was the fibroids um, that I got treated for. Then the last one there is hysteroscopy and in this procedure a doctor inserts a small lighted telescope called a hysteroscope through the cervix into the uterus. The doctor then injects saline into the uterus, expanding the uterine cavity, allowing the doctor to examine the walls of the uterus and the openings of the fallopian tube. So another question I have had so many times is, can fibrins turn into cancer? It's a question you and me will ask both. But what I have found is that most fibrins are benign. That means they are not cancerous. Rarely, in like one in a thousand people with fibroids, a cancerous fibroid will occur. So almost always when they take out fibroids during the surgery, they are going to do a biopsy. And I mean, they're going to do a histology or pathological report to determine whether they, there is cancer, cancer or no cancer. So this is called a leomyosarcoma. So remember the other one I have said it's leomyoma. The one that has cancer is called leomyosarcoma. 
Doctors think that these cancers do not arise from an already existing fibroids and having fibroids has never been associated with an increase in the risk of developing cancerous fibroids. So it could just be bad luck that you just got cancerous fibroid. Having fibroids also does not increase a, woman ch a woman's chances of getting other forms of cancer in the uterus. So that should not be very scary. So the other thing about fibroids uh, and questions that I get about them is if what if I become pregnant and I have fibroids? So women who have fibroids are more likely to have problems during pregnancy and delivery. This I have experienced and I will tell you shortly uh, that story. This does not mean that there will be problems and most women will with fibroids have normal pregnancies. Usually some, it depends on whether you have symptomatic fibroids or not. Those without symptomatic fibroids, they may not even experience any symptoms. They may not even know that they have the fibroids in the first place. But for a few women with symptomatic fibroids, remember we said about 30% will be symptomatic, then there will be a few issues. So the major risks or problems associated with fibroids is the increase in the chances of you having a C-section or cesarean section. Uh, it is usually six times greater for women with fibroids to go through CS uh, as, as compared to their other counterparts. Then malpresentation and malpositioning of the baby due to the fibroids as also common. Then lack of or obstructed labor or prolonged labor labor fails to progress with fibroids, that could happen. In some cases, we may have placenta abruption, and this is when the placenta breaks away from the wall of the uterus before delivery, and this is usually an obstetric emergency, and most likely you will end up in theater, and that baby, despite the gestation, will have to be delivered. This is because the fetus cannot get enough oxygen with this condition, and also the, it puts the mother at jeopardy, because you can imagine, the cause of bleeding that could occur if that separates and you're not aware. Then there is preterm delivery. This could happen especially because of the pressure, because the baby already puts enough pressure on the abdomen. So assuming you have a large fibroid, again, that could lead to preterm labor. Usually the, um, the fundal height with fibroids is usually a bit more exaggerated because I remember when I was eight weeks, my fundal height was at 18 and that continued all along so that when I was 20 weeks, I was almost 34 weeks per fundal height. So that changes and this is because the masses are also quite big. So how are fibroids treated this is another question that is very, very important and those without symptoms will require no treatment at all other than just usual observations and monitoring. Then the mode of treatment will depend on the following things. One, whether there are symptoms or not. If you want to become pregnant in future, the size of the fibroids, the location of the fibroids, and the age and how close you to menopause you might be. If you have fibroids but not have any sy symptoms, no treatment will be offered. Your doctor will do regular exams to see if they are growing. So for treatment options, remember I've said it depends on a number of factors. So if you have symptomatic fibroids, then again there will be treatment. If you have a symptomatic treatment, uh, fibroids, then there is medical observation. So for treatment, treating symptomatic fibroids, again, if fertility is not desired and you wish to spare the uterus but you don't want to get pregnant, uh, then a myomectomy could be done or pre-surgical medical treatment or long-term medical treatment. Another thing that could be done is uterine artery embolization just to keep those symptoms at bay and prevent further uh, deterioration of the quality of life. Where fertility is not desired, but you do not wish to spare the uterus, then a hysterectomy will be done. Then the other scenario is if fertility is desired and the fibroids are symptomatic, there are two ways that this could go. One, pre-surgical treatment that is using medications and then probably a myomectomy to spare. Of course, if you want fertility, fertility will happen and implantation will happen in the uterus, so you need your uterus. Then 
Another option would be long-term medical treatment. So it all depends on the age of the woman and what they want and the symptoms. Looking at the medical management, I have summarized it into five, but there is more that I do not wish to put here. The first one is pain management, and depending on the severity of the pain, you could start with over-the-counter painkillers, the ones that you just say of prescribing by, and that sorts your pain. If these are no longer working, you can get a prescription for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs such as ibuprofen, acetaminophen, those things that are offered again. They could also be over the counter, but sometimes you need a prescription for some of them, like Ponstan. Then you could go to mild opiates such as uh, Tramadol, uh, DF-118, those ones that will sort a mild or to moderate level of pain. For severe, severe pain, then opiates are used, again, with a lot of discretion and a lot of moderation because they will be used for a day or two and then you're discharged or you're given the mild opiates or the NSAIDs to maintain you. Then we have hematinics or drugs to help build blood, especially if the fibroids are causing heavy bleeding. These include, there's so many in the market, and these are, for example, IFAS, what you get in the free uh, Atano Healthcare, MCHFP clinics, you will get IFAS, it is government provided, and I think uh, Beyond Zero Campaign had a role to play in this because in the past they used to be sold, but nowadays any government facility from the dispensary going or the West National Referral will have IFAS. So if you are able, to, you are not able to afford anything else. I first can sort you, uh, because they are just iron and folate supplement combined together. Then we have ranferon, uh, zifi, vitaglobin, uh, pregnancy care, pregnant care, all those, you know them, they can help. Then we have combined oral contraceptives, um, and this usually help to balance the hormone levels. They, they could be in pills or injectables. We have a combined uh, injectable and uh, contraceptive that is usually given once a month, but it is very rare to find. So commonly you will find the COC pills, and these ones are available over the counter. This is, for example, Femiplan, Chagualango, all those brands are. COC. They can help control the fibroid growth and help control the heavy bleeding by balancing the hormone levels. Then progestin only contraceptives and this can be progestin only pills. They can help control heavy bleeding. The same issue is true for progesterone like uh, injections such as Depo-Provera and intrauterine devices such as Mirena, which contains a small amount of progestin-like medications which can control the heavy bleeding as well as used for birth control. Then we have gonadotrophin releasing hormone agonists uh, and the most commonly one used in the market is Lupron but we also have other brands such as Lupridex. We have quite a number now in the market but the one that has been known for quite some time is Lupron. Uh, but we have others that are coming up. We have a company called BSV and they have very good products for women experiencing these fibroids. Endometriosis that I had described earlier, some of those uh, endometri endometrial cancers, uh, those reproductive organ cancers, they have products that actually can help uh, prevent the symptoms or make your life a little bit easier. All right. So then option number two, if uh, medical management is not helping you, then you can opt for a surgical procedure. And again, before you undertake any of this treatment, you need to have information, ask your doctor, your obstetrician, your gyna to explain much more and to help you choose or to give you the number of options you have and then you can make an informed decision. So again, it depends on whether you want to conceive or you ever want to have children or you are finished with that chapter. So if you still want to have children and you want, a surgical procedure would help, then myomectomy is the way to go. And it can be done either laparoscopically or lapar with a laparotomy that's an open myo. So this is surgery to remove fibroids without taking out the healthy tissue of the uterus. 
it is best for women who wish to have children after treatment for their fibroids or who wish to keep their uterus for other reasons. You can become pregnant after myomectomy, but if your fibroids are embedded deeply in the uterus, you might need a cesarean section to deliver. Myomectomy can be performed in many ways. It can be major surgery that involves cutting into the abdomen or performed with a laparoscopy or hysteroscopy. The type of surgery that can be done depends on the type, size, and location of the fibroids. And after myomectomy, new fibroids can grow and cause trouble after. All these possible risks of surgery are true for myomectomy. The risk depends on how extensive the surgery is. Then surgery number two is called a hysterectomy, and it could be a subtotal hysterectomy or partial hysterectomy. Uh, and this is surgery to remove the uterus. The surgery is the only sure way to cure uterine fibroids because without the uterus, there is nowhere those fibroids could attach. Uh, but the most common and the most common reason that a hysterectomy is performed. This surgery is used when a woman's fibroids are large, if she has heavy bleeding or is either near or past menopause or does not want children at all. If the uterus, if the fibroids, um, sorry, if the uterus, if the fibroids are smaller, the doctor may be able to reach the uterus through the vagina instead of making a cut in the abdomen. And in some cases, a hysterectomy may be performed through a laparoscope, removing the ovaries and the cervix at the time of the hysterectomy is usually optional. You can spare them. You can want to remain with your cervix. You can want to remain with the ovaries. But sometimes most people will choose a total hysterectomy where everything will be taken out because, again, having these organs and you do not need them at the time uh, may is predisposing you to other forms of diseases that arise from these organs and we know them and they can be quite severe. Women whose ovaries are not removed do not need to go into menopause at the time of hysterectomy, but those whose ovaries are removed, they could be put on hormonal therapy because of the symptoms that will come in. Then hysterectomy is a major surgery and it is safe, uh, does not have many risks or complications. However, you need a few weeks or several weeks to recover again from a hysterectomy. Another surgical op operation is endometrial ablation, and this is where the lining of the uterus is removed or destroyed to control heavy bleeding. This can be done with a laser, wire loops, boiling water, electric current, microwaves, freezing, and other methods. This procedure is usually considered minor surgery, and it can be done on an outpatient basis or even in the doctor's office. Complications can occur, but they are uncommon with most of the methods. Most people recover quickly. About half of women will have who have this procedure will no longer have menstrual bleeding. And there are about 3 in 10 women have much lighter bleeding, but a woman cannot have children after this surgery. Then we have myolysis, and this is where a needle will be inserted into the fibroids, usually guided uh, by a laparoscope and an electric current or freezing will be used to destroy the fibroid. So this is attacking the fibroids one on one, mono a mono. Then we have uterine fibroid embolization or UFE and or uterine artery embolization. And this is where a thin tube is thread into the blood vessels that supply into the fibroid. Then the tiny plastic or gel particles are injected into the blood vessels. This blocks the blood supply to the fibroid, causing it to shrink. UFE can be done as an outpatient or inpatient procedure. Complications including early menopause are uncommon but can occur. Studies suggest that fibroids are not likely to grow back after UFE, but more long-term research is needed. Not all fibroids can be treated with UFE, and the best candidate for UFE are women with A, fibroids that are causing heavy bleeding, have fibroids that are causing pain or pressing on the bladder or rectum, don't want to have a hysterectomy or do not want to have children in the future. So we still have newer methods of treating uterine fibroids and these are still in medical research and different organizations are working on them. And some of them are not covered by the health insurance and some doctors will not even advise you do this because they are still in the trials. Uh, we have something called radiofrequency ablation that uses heat to destroy fibroid tissue without harming the surrounding normal uterine tissue. The fibroids remain inside the uterus but they shrink in size. Most women go home in the same day and can return to normal activities within a few days. 
Number two is anti-hormonal drugs, and these ones are still doing a number of trials on them. I know some good companies will be giving us some some product, uh, so probably soon. Uh, but they provide symptom relief without the bone bleeding side effects of the hormonal treatments. Remember, if you put you're put on low dose long term hormonal treatment, that could actually lead to the side effects of bone thinning. If you do the GRH or the gonadotrophin releasing hormone uh, and agonist, then you may end up experiencing symptoms of menopausal women. So for these presentations, I used these references and I am going now to give my story of the fibroids. So I first got married in my late 20s and I did not know I had fibroids until I was trying to conceive my TTC journey. So a few years into these trials or trying to conceive, then I go for a medical checkup like normal people usually do. And then I first was told I have PCOS. I will be covering PCOS uh, sooner rather than later in a video. And I got treatment for, I started, I was put into some treatment for PCOS. Then later, that was an abdominal ultrasound that had been done. They did not find the fibroids then. Then a, a transvaginal ultrasound was requested, and when I did that one, uh, it showed submucosal fibroids. So at that point, I was put on Lupron. So I did three cycles of Lupron, and that was helpful. They shrank in size. I was feeling better, but still there was no conception. So I remember at the same time, I was dealing with PCOS and uh, fibroids. Uh, I did not actually believe I had PCOS though because I was I did not display the characteristic features of PCOS per se as a syndrome. And later one of the doctors told me I had to get a number of opinions. Um, and I had a few doctors tell me they don't think I have PCOS, but they think I have PCO. So PCO polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS. Uh, usually has a number of very noticeable characteristics and these include hoarseness of voice. Uh, women with PCOS will have a deeper than normal female voice. They will have facial hair or hirsutism hair in places women don't get a lot of hair, especially the beard and chest hair. Then they also are usually bigger or heavier and they struggle with weight a lot. So I, that, at that point I was quite skinny. I actually had to add weight because I was below 50 kgs. So then uh, one of the doctors said I had lean PCOS. Uh, and this is a PCOS, a form of PCOS that occurs in women who are of smaller body size, but they still have the polycystic ovaries. So polycystic ova ovaries, uh, the other symptom is that the ovaries on... Um, ultrasound they will see the many 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 cysts so these cysts will cause trouble in conceiving because you're not probably producing uh, ova or eggs as you should be and therefore your menses are uh, an ovula yeah, you're not ovulating during you do not have any ovulation so you are not having any ovulation cycles in the cycle so you just have menses but are blank ones then the other symptom of PCOS, uh, I don't even know why I'm talking about PCOS and this is a fibroid story, but now I am trying to explain the different things that were happening that could have been associated with both fibroids and PCOS. I had abdominal pain uh, that is not common in PCOS and nobody thought about checking fibroids until later. So when I did... Uh, a, a test called HSG was requested. I have mentioned it in this video somewhere in there. That is when they saw now the fibroids because they were sub mucosal fibroids. They were not very large. The largest was five centimeters in the largest diameter, and the smallest, there were three of them. The other one was three centimeters, and the other one was small. They were insignificant, they were below two centimeters in diameter. So, these fibroids, I got to prone, and that was sorted. But I didn't, still didn't conceive until I continued with the treatment for the PCOS. So that is where the PCOS is significant in this story. So I continue with treatment and then I conceive. When I conceived, now I am expecting and I go for my first scan. I did my first scan at 
10 weeks or 12 weeks around there the one that confirms the phytomorphology and the characteristics and that is when again I was uh, they noticed I had developed other fibroids and remember this was like a year after I had done the Lupron 3 cycles and my fibroids had disappeared so now I, the sonograph was showing I have fibroids and I'm telling these people I do not have fibroids, I got treated and I did not know that they usually come back. So they had come back. But then in the second trimester during my first pregnancy, I underwent something called uh, red, degen I think red degeneration of fibroids. And this is a painful procedure where, a painful actually experience where the fibroids are usually compressed or pressed on by the baby, enlarging baby. It happens as the baby gains more weight and this happens in the second to the third trimester. And at that point when the baby lies on the fibroid sphere is square, they actually deprive them of the blood supply and they actually shrink and become insignificant. So eventually you will end up with no fibroids because the baby has actually slept on them and they have finished. It was a, a small um it was a very short period of agony because i had pain for about three weeks and then that pain was gone so i continued the pregnancy i continued working and i got my baby then um when my baby was two years and some change i conceived again and then now this time I did not actually know i was expecting because i went to hospital with severe abdominal pain and it was during my menses, but this pain was just in something else, like your stomach is just angry at you. And so I went and I was told to do an ultrasound, which I did because my insides were killing me. I was feeling like my intestines are just, I was thinking it's something with the, like intestinal obstruction or something in my intestines. But then, voila, they discovered I was expecting and I had a very large fibroid. So they're telling me about the fibroids and I'm telling them I did not have any fibroids because my fibroids ended with the pregnancy because at 35 weeks, the last trimester I did a scan in my first pregnancy and the fibroids were gone. So now the second pregnancy I am told uh, it's actually diagnosed in that dramatic abdominal pain episode. And that was so bad because I was having abdominal pain, I was throwing up, I was having frequent maturation, but this all did not ring to me like this is fibroids. I thought it is something else to do with my food tract, my GIT. So I begin my journey and this fibroid is just something else. It is trying to, I don't know what it wanted, but I had a very angry uterus to say the least. And this uterus was carrying my precious baby. And therefore, at some point, I'm told this pregnancy may not actually go to term. It may be a preterm. It may be very dramatic. We may need to just treat the fibroid, which may mean expelling the baby. But then I had this faith and I'm like, no, I want my baby. I want this baby. Uh, and remember, this is a baby I did not know I had, but I just wanted the baby. So it continued. And... At some point, the pain was a lot, so much so that I was on morphine. I had to go to hospital a few times. I got admitted, I think, once or twice. So that was dramatic. So I thought now, because in my first pregnancy, I went through a cesarean. I thought the second one would be a cesarean plus myomectomy, removing of the fibroids. But that was not possible. The pain got too much at from 35 weeks and we had delivered the baby at around that time. Thank God the baby was big enough. He was about 3.5 kgs. He didn't have to go to nursery. But then that, that was a little bit, uh, there was a bit of relief. But they were not able to take out my fibroid during that surgery. So four months into, about no, about three months into, about 12 weeks, after I got my baby, I still had very heavy bleeding. You know, like the way you get a baby and you have those lochia. So my lochia did not stop, did not change in color. It remains red. So it never went through those stages of lochia. You know, the way it starts and then it goes and it lessens in the amount. It was maternity parts from day one to month three. 
So at this point, I call my doctor and he says, no, we need to get you checked. You need to do a scan. So I do a scan. I send him the results. And then, then they're like, we just need to take this thing out because it is this thing that is causing trouble because it is still big enough. During pregnancy, it grew from 6 centimeters to about 15 or 16 centimeters in size. So it was a large mass. And it can cause drama. The pain, whew, I do not even want to emphasize on this part because it. I could hold my baby and I am crying and my baby is crying and we are all crying. And we are crying for different reasons. But then, uh, so at fourth month post the CS, I actually decided to do the, the myomectomy. So I come with my young baby and I do my myomectomy and all is well but again that again the bleeding did not stop you know post myomectomy you still have some sort of bleeding and that stopped again six weeks later so in short following my baby and i had started even bleeding spotting and that was before i got my child and that continued all the way to the six and a half month mark that is when i actually stopped having any sort of bleeding then I stay for a month or two and then I experience very, very heavy bleeding again. And this was for about seven days. And then I'm like, I am not going to do any other scans. I just don't want to know what the uterus is communicating, but I am just not going to do that. So I went and I had a depot injection and this helped. Actually, I did not see menses for another three months. So close to that, um, the, the appointment for depot, I actually went for it earlier. And that sorted my issues but then uh, a few months post when my baby was a year and some change again the bleeding came back and i did not want to go for depot but then i had to go for depot because it actually was helping with the symptoms as well as using it as a form of family planning so yeah that's my favorite story it's a lot of drama I could still be suffering from the same because sometimes I experience a lot of pain, a lot of bleeding, but I am still trying to decide what I'm going to do about it because favorites are not my, mm, my cup of tea. I just do not want to talk about them anymore. I just need a break. They are not giving me a break. So I will do a scan eventually. I might actually do one tomorrow. So... I keep booking and postponing my appointments because I just, I am tired about these things. So that's my so short story. I hope it encourages you to seek health care. I hope it encourages you because there are non-surgical options. There are surgical options. There are even home remedies. Having a hot water bottle actually does help. But if you're experiencing heavy bleeding, do not put that hot water bottle on your abdomen. You are going to bleed like crazy. You better use a nice pack because, whew, you, if you have experienced heavy bleeding because of fibroids, sometimes it's just like a running tap. It is just so much. And if you're in the house, you just want to just be in your room and in the toilet all the time because it is a lot of blood coming out of you. And then you also need to think about how you're going to eat and feed properly so that you replenish the blood you're going to lose because it can be quite an amount at some point i had a hp of six but i did not order transfusion so i did food uh, diet and controlling the breathing with whatever treatment i was given and that helped so until next time keep watching my video keep subscribing and share comments and also share your favorite experiences in the comment section below bye and ciao